Uh, today, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker, Lauren Hood. She's been involved in our community for 12 years. And um, <clears throat> during that time, she's done a lot of volunteer work for us. One of which Eve just mentioned, which is the big tour of, of heading up a search team. And we got the good results, the wonderful results of Eve. <laughs> so served on the Luna Rising um, volunteer coordinating team. And um, that's our annual event for that's devoted to women and, and their spirituality. And she's been a CYRE teacher with some of our younger children. So um, she's done many things for our, for our community. And so today, Lauren will speak for about 20 minutes. And uh, before Lauren starts, however, I would invite everyone to mute yourself um, so that we will not have any disturbances from anybody else's homes. Um, during that time, you can write any questions that, uh, or at, Lauren will speak for 20 minutes. And then after that, we'll have about 10 minutes of question and answer. And during that time, you can write your questions in chat. And I recognize most of you, so I think you know how to use chat by now. You can write them while she's speaking or even after she starts. And then I will read the questions, read through and select the question. So, um, so we thank you very much, Lauren, and I'll turn things over to you. Okay, thanks. Well, it's good to see everyone this morning. And um, I also appreciate your joining me early. I have my caffeine here, so feel free to partake of yours as well. Um, this is my second time doing Frito, although I think I came at it from a pretty different direction this time. So last time I really focused, I think, on my um, religious experiences and how I ended up a UU. And this time I was really reflecting on you know, how did I, how did I become who I say I am <laughs> or who do I say I am and how did I get here? Um, one of the things that I say often at work when I'm asked to speak at events and, you know, people are often like, how did you get to where you are in your career? And um, I feel like it's the same in work and life that I'm sort of an accidental tourist in my own life. Um, I just kind of follow the path that seems the right one at the moment and I end up where I am and it, oh, it you know, eventually seems to be where I'm supposed to be. Uh, I am definitely not the kind of person who sets five-year goals or 10-year goals, um, unless I'm forced to somewhere, um, and I never look at them again when I do. I really um, like to ponder where am I right now, where, um, you know, what's missing, or, you know, what do I wish I had, and, and how do I get there? And along the way, I kind of learn more things about myself and, and who I want to be. So, um, I grew up with a, a pretty myopic view of the world, as maybe a lot of us do um, in my, you know, little community. I um, grew up outside of, of Philadelphia in a um, Jewish family in a largely Jewish community. I thought like the whole world, everybody was Jewish until I um, moved to the South for college uh, and realized that I was part of a minority that I didn't even know I was part of. Um, but I also grew up in a... Um, in a family, in a community, at least my perception was, I, I grew up with this understanding that there's a right way to do things, there's right things to believe, there's right ways to behave, there's right ways to, to think. Um, and so I spent a lot of my um, young years, my like through my 20s, just trying to get it right. Like just trying to act the right way, behave the right way, fit in. Um, and really looking to others to define me. I, I often kind of felt like I was a chameleon. I, I, you know, I could fit in with any group, but I didn't feel like I belonged with them. Like I remember, um, even like with music growing up, my friends who liked pop music thought that I was a fan of rock and my, you know, because I didn't really know their music and my friends that were into rock thought that I was a fan of pop music because I, you know, so I was always trying to be somebody that I wasn't. I was just kind of looking outside of myself. Um, and I would say a huge turning point for me um, for a variety of reasons, but really in um, defining myself. Sorry, I just saw... <laughs> <He's chat. laughs> 
um, was attending um, some education that I still participate in now that is really um, kind of based in the idea of ontology. So it's the study of being as in human beings, who do we be in the world? Um, and through that education, I really learned a lot of new ways about how I could view myself in the world, how I could view the world around me. Um, so a couple things that I learned about myself in that were that I was kind of pursuing this someday satisfaction, you know, the, um, any of you that I'm friends on Facebook, I actually posted something related to this recently that's like, someday I'll be happy, you know, when I lose 20 pounds or when I graduate from college or when I get my master's degree or when I meet the right guy or when I divorce the wrong guy. <laughs> and so I was always kind of waiting for that someday. Um, and I also realized, and this is maybe the most important one, that um, a lot of the things that I believed about myself, the, the way I am, you know, is are things that I just made up, like something happens and I made it mean something about me and therefore I was like, I, or I am, I am shy or I am not creative or whatever it was that I was in the world, you know, I just made up. Um, and that was a really freeing experience to get like, okay, all of these limiting things I, that I have about myself and others really I made up also mean that I could make something else up. Um, and that's a skill that I really um, still draw upon. Like, what is it that I choose to be? Who do I choose to be? Um, and I can shift that. Um, and I can shift that over time, but I also can shift that in the moment. So um, Colin and I actually met in one of these seminars. <laughs> um, and it's actually a really powerful tool to have as a couple because we can get in the moment when we're having whatever couples have some sort of disagreement or we're behaving in a way that's not who we say we are. Like one of us can stop and be like, you know, let's rewind. We don't have to be this way. We can choose another one, another way to go at this issue, which is, you know, really powerful tool to have in life. And, and also I've done it with my kids where I've just realized like I'm yelling at a kid or I'm, you know, behaving in a way that I don't, it's not the mom I want to be. Like I'll actually stop and I'll apologize to them and I'll, you know, kind of reset what I'm committed to as a parent and let them know that um, so that I can, you know, show up the way I, I want to show up. Um, so it's kind of a power, I guess, of, of being able to observe myself. Um, so that helped me really stop feeling like a fraud um, in a lot of ways. I've been kind of walking through life feeling like I wasn't fitting into this perfect image of myself. Um, or of who I should be. And I just started to, you know, own who I was going to be in the world. Um, and I also discovered that there is a real power in allowing myself to be vulnerable. So, and this, this is a lesson I got to keep learning. <laughs> There's a lot of lessons to keep learning again and again in life, but um, because I was always hiding and always trying to portray this image of I've got it all together. Um, I'm really good at it and people believe it. Um, and then that distances me from people because they think I have it all together. And so they don't want to admit to me whatever they've got going on. Um, and I've found that there's really something powerful and, you know, the Brene Brown view of the world of, you know, the power of being vulnerable. And it's, it's really difficult, but it really um, makes a difference in being able to create and sustain relationships. Um, I actually was, I'm reading right now, Glennon Doyle, Untamed. And um, yeah, she's amazing. We actually um, at work had um, Glennon Doyle and Abby Wamba do a broadcast for us and together they're just amazing. But I just read something actually yesterday in her book that so touched um, what I'm referring to about like this realization that I'm not perfect. And it, it also relates to the idea of you know, how do human beings operate? So she said uh, in her first book, she described herself as broken, but now she realizes that that's ridiculous because broken means does not function as it was designed to function. So a broken human is one who does not function the way humans are designed to function. Um, and she actually realized that, that humans operate in a pretty predictable way. She said, we hurt people, we're hurt by people. We feel left out, envious, not good enough, sick and tired. We have unrealized dreams and deep regrets. We're certain we're meant for more and that we don't even deserve what we have. <laughs> we're so afraid of dying. 
also of living. Um, we don't understand ourselves, we're lonely, we want to be left alone, we want to belong, we want to be loved. Um, and so she said, if you're uncomfortable, in deep pain, angry, yearning, confused, um, you don't have a problem, you have a life. <laughs> being human is not hard because you're doing it wrong, it's, it's hard because you're doing it right. Um, and so I, that was, it, it, those were new ways of me for, to articulate that, but it was so, um, so touched on, you know, that realization for me to get like the problem that, that this is it, this is life, the, the problems and the discomfort and the, the pain and the, and the suffering. So um, that was really the, what I would say is opens a path for me to discover what matters to me. Um, and going back to the accidental tourist, you know, really tapping into the next experience um, to engage with it and, and learn more about myself and learn more about what matters um, to me. Um, and I continued to seek out people that I aspire to be like. Um, but instead of doing it, I used to like seek out people that I thought were so great and so cool and so powerful because I thought like through osmosis, I was going to get whatever they had and around them, I was always hiding because I didn't want them to know that I had nothing that they had. Um, and now I was really able to engage with them in that vulnerable way to learn from them and to grow from them. Um, so um, I kind of had been waiting for this bolt of lightning to hit me like someday I'll be um, you know, someday I'll be creative back to that someday I'll be happy is like, someday I'll figure out who I'm meant to be in the world. And so that's when I really started to choose what what kind of world I wanted to be in what who I wanted to be in the world. And I'd say, you know, reflecting on it, there were really three areas that were critical to me. Um, the first one was community, um, really living in community and being a key part of a community or communities. Um, the power of not knowing, like really living committed to not knowing um, versus I always had to know, I had to know the way and, and you know, I was going to be there when I figured it all out uh, and being a cause in my life. Um, so in terms of community, I've really found that in some really um, profound and cool ways. Um, some of you may have seen my license plate on my car that says a wild woman. Um, I'm probably not as wild as I used to be, um, but that actually refers to a group of friends that I have in Raleigh um, that I actually um, met around the time that I first started participating in that education. Um, and we call ourselves the wild women. So there's about probably 12 to 15 of us that are really a core group that have been friends. We're just about to have our 25 year anniversary of the Wild Women. Um, we're going away on a trip to celebrate our 25 years. Um, and uh, it's just a really powerful group of, of women and it's all about kind of calling each other to be in the world. We, we're like, we range in age from probably late thirties to mid sixties, um, all different types of careers or not careers, uh, different types of um, sexual orientation and uh, all different kinds of experiences in life. But we all just are committed to being whoever we, whoever calling each other to be who we say we are, I would say we really, um, bring each other forth in, in lots of really beautiful ways. Um, and then I also have this really bizarre eclectic family from work. Um, people I used to work with almost 20 years ago now um, from all over the country. Um, and interestingly, the team that I was on was all about kind of who, we're, who we wanna be as a company. It was, it was focused on our corporate culture. And when we stopped working together, we said, well, we don't want to stop traveling together. So we go on vacation together a couple times a year. And um, just, you know, we're again, a very eclectic group of um, all different from all over the world, men and women. And um, we've seen each other through relationships and babies and <laughs> uh, hysterectomies and parents dying and, and everything. Um, so just really fabulous to be able to just tap into wherever I am creating community. And um, one of the highest compliments I ever got from somebody was 
um, she had been watching some show and they were talking about, you know, some people are connectors, they bring people together. And she said, you know, I immediately thought of you, Lauren, because I'm constantly trying to be the one that's causing community, causing relationship, mainly selfishly for me, because it's really important to me that I have it. Um, but it, you know, it pays off for, for everybody. Um, and Lunar Rising has also been that for me. Um, and that was a, a great example of in the past, I would have like waited to be invited. Like I, you know, I wanted to be the one that they wanted to be part of Lunar Rising. And, and after a couple of years of going when no one was inviting me, I just kind of timidly walked up to Lisa Hagen and was like, could I be one of you? <laughs> um, and it's been a really great way. I mean, it's been a lot of great ways to get involved with the UCC, but that's been one that really has created this really close connection of community that I was looking for. Um, so that's kind of the community aspect of it. Um, I talked about the power of not knowing. Um, for me, UU is very much that. Um, so I grew up in this conservative Jewish home where you know you you are this thing and you don't ask why. It's it's you know it, why is because you're Jewish. That, that's all there is. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter if you believe. You don't have to believe. You just have to, or maybe you do have to believe, but you don't have to know why you believe. Um, everything from, you know, all of the prayers are in Hebrew and you're just kind of blindly saying these things. And yes, you can read the English on the other side, but you don't have to um, just say these things because you're supposed to say these things. Um, and so Colin and I really found the Unitarian Universalism together. Um, we were both really interested in discovery, discovering what do we believe um, about the world, about ourselves, about family and community. And um, to me that, you know, it keeps paying um, the, you know, to be able to be involved in a community that values that as well. Um, also through travel, we've done a lot of travel um, and we've really kind of gotten addicted to these bicycle tours um, because they're really a wonderful way to see the world from like this level instead of this level. Um, and engage. So we've been to, um, where have we been on our trips? We went from Prague to Vienna on a bicycle trip. We traveled um, the island of Crete on a bicycle trip and Croatia a few years ago. Last summer, we were supposed to go to Sweden and Denmark. Of course, that didn't happen, but we'll get back. Um, but just have learned so much about myself from engaging with different cultures. Um, and that's been a big part of my discovery is engaging with people who are different from me. Um, and then also so many of you know that I worked in, um, many of you don't know, I don't do this anymore, but I worked in diversity and inclusion for eight years. I just changed jobs. Um, but that was another way to you know, really engage with what makes me different from people and what makes others different from me and what's the beauty in that um, really. And, and I have to say, I didn't even know what diversity and inclusion was before I started that job. Um, and for anyone who has known me for maybe the last five years, um, that's probably hard to believe because I got so committed and engaged in it. Um, and that was an example of being that accidental tourist and just plopping in somewhere that made sex sense as the next move. And it turned out to be right where I belonged for that period of time in my life. Um, and then the last thing that I'll, I'll share is um, that the, the lesson that I had learned about being a cause in my life. Um, this is probably much to Colin chagrin, um, <laughs> but I am um, notorious for um, making a choice, seeing something I want and throwing my hat over the wall and just doing it. Um, I once was coached that there are no hard decisions. We usually know exactly what we wanna do. We, what's difficult is we don't wanna deal with the consequences. Um, and I very much believe that. Like I pretty quickly know exactly what I wanna do. And so I can either um, swirl a lot and but what about this and what about that or I can just do it and deal with the circumstances so um, Carol back to our conversation at the beginning that's why I had a baby at 46 years old <laughs> it was not an accident it was Lauren saying I never had a biological child and it's literally my only regret in life and we're going to make it happen and we made it happen um, I was crazy to do so and I'll still say so, but, um, but I've never regretted it because it was, you know, I knew exactly what I wanted. Um, and I, I do that with 
moves and career changes. Colin says, um, whenever I start a conversation with, so I was thinking, <laughs> he's, in, he's in trouble. Because <laughs> if I'm thinking something, we're going to do it. <laughs> Um, but, you know, to me, I, I just, you know, I don't want to swirl in the coulda, woulda, shoulda. I, I don't like to live that way. I like to live in the, if, you know, if this is important to me and, and, hope, and important to our family, then let's go for it. Um, so that's what I had to share. Um, I think what's next for me in terms of exploration is figuring out, who, you know, who am I outside of the corporate world? Um, I'm probably done with this career in the next five to seven years, but I don't know what that means at the end of this. So that's, that's where I go from here. And I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, I see that we've gotten a few questions and um, I, one of them is, is what do you do for self-care? So that's an interesting question. Um, I have a friend, she and I joke that like, uh, like I, I'm not the take a bath and do a, like I'll do a massage, but for me that's, I'm getting something done. Um, so self-care for me is really community. It's spending time with my friends, um, spending time with people that make me laugh. Um, travel is self-care, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not great at being alone, I have to admit. <laughs> if you hadn't noticed I'm an extrovert, I really gain my energy from other people. And um, so it's really self-care is being around people I care about. All right. Questions from your, your personal life. What part of Philadelphia were you from and what Jewish sect? Yeah, so um, I grew up in the northeast part of Philadelphia um, in, an, I, in an area called Elkins Park. Um, so Sheltonham, Abington, anyone who knows the area, um, that's the, the area that I'm from. And I, um, it was conservative Judaism. Um, I, I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> um, but it was, I went to Hebrew school for, gosh, 12 years, 10 hours a week. Um, it, you know, and, and there's a lot of wonderful things about it. I mean, because of Hebrew school, I got really interested in literature. Studying the, the Torah was really interesting to me, studying the, the, the stories of the Torah. That's why, I, that's why I majored in English in college, was I just really enjoyed um, interpretation of, of text. All right. Um, okay, here's one. This will only take an hour or two. Uh, how, would, how would you describe your child rearing theory? So, well, one of them is I tell Colin all the time, I'm like, it's their job to try and get, get away with stuff and it's our job to catch them. <laughs> um, so um, I feel like it's, um, you know, mainly about letting my kids discover who they are and, you know, setting up some bumper rails um, we've had some interesting experiences lately with our older one, who's a teenager, um, where we're realizing maybe the bumper rails have to be a little higher than we thought they needed to be. Um, but, but it's really important to me that they do, um, they do get to discover themselves, uh, you know, kind of going back to that. I didn't really, and I, it's not like my parents ever said I couldn't, but I, but because I, they were so sure of everything, I felt like I had to be really sure of everything. So it's important to me that they see me as human and that they realize that um, growth is a lifelong process. Okay. Um, here's one. It says you started with life as, as a random process. Question mark. I'm sorry, you froze up, Carol. Oh, can you hear me now? Uh-huh. Okay. You started life as a random process, but now you're quite directed, question mark? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm directed in that I feel like I know who I am, but you know, I mentioned that I just changed jobs um, and my new job has nothing to do with what I was doing before. Um, and it's really interesting because I thought like I found diversity and inclusion and I was so committed to it. and. 
and you know, and I had said a few years ago, I you know, I never could take another job if I wasn't as committed to it. And then I just kind of was got to a point where I didn't think I was done with DNI, but I knew I couldn't do it where I work anymore. So I said, at least for the time being, let me do something else. And it actually was really free, freeing to do something new, to kind of exercise my brain in a new way, to not have the same conversation like I, that I feel like I've been having for the last five years. So um, I still really appreciate the value in just throwing the hat over the wall and, and trying something new. And that's what I meant too about, you know, what's next after the corporate world. Cause I, as I work for Bank of America, it's a huge corporation, obviously. I've had a really diverse career doing a lot of different things, which is what that enables me, but, um, but it's still in a corporation. So I have, you know, all of this structure around me and, um, you know, I know I don't want to do that forever. So I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm ready to say I'm structured in this way. <laughs> okay. Um, and this may need to be our last question, uh, depending on our time. It says, if your parents are still living, uh, how would you describe your relationship with them given your change in religious views? So the change in religious views hasn't changed our relationship too much. It was a very difficult conversation to tell them um, that I did no, no longer considered myself um, a practicing Jew, although I still consider myself Jewish in a lot of ways culturally. Um, they struggled as I did um, with the word church. And my mom said to me many times, why does it have to be called a church? Now, what's interesting is now I don't know what to call it because I like, you know, I was like the biggest cheerleader for we can't be a church. And now I don't know where to say I'm going. I mean, I'm not going to say to my parents, I'm going to two, three, four. Um, but, <laughs> But um, I, my parents are still living. I, um, I think a lot of the change in our relationship has more come with, um, you know, the age and where they are. Um, it has come to from my, my lack of willingness to have it be a right way. And because particularly my father is very much, this is the way it is. Um, you know, I kind of decided at some point in time, I can either argue with him or just be quiet. <laughs> I, my brother chose the argue route. I chose the be quiet route. Um, and neither one is that fulfilling. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to have to close now because, um, our time is about up and we have a, a, a community service to, attend at 930. But Lauren, thank you so much for presenting today. I, I, I know I and I think a lot of people have learned new things about you and come to appreciate you even more. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, glad you enjoyed it. And uh, thank you again.